Good evening from Melbourne, Australia, everyone. <clears throat> this is Wayne Fowler from We Are The Overcomers. And I welcome you to join me as we take a moment, which I think is really kind of important, to cover the three harvests that I think are about to, about to take place. And this is the best time for it to try to get more of a graphic representation of what I'm trying to show you as, you know, so that it will help those who are more visually oriented to kind of kind of get an idea. <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time actually getting through to, uh, uh, to uh, in a lot of different messages where I've covered the, what I believe is the fact Texas Sweet Pea, welcome. Uh, what I believe is the fact that there are three harvests and not just one. There is a pre, there is a mid, there is a post. All three, because they fit within the harvest model that is throughout the Bible. And I've spent dozens and dozens of messages that have covered that in such deep detail. But I think it's it, it's about time for me to actually go in and cover some things where you can actually see a visual representation. Now, I'm not the greatest drawer in the world, but I, I really felt the urge at four o'clock this morning. I was really feeling Holy Spirit. Bar Star, how you doing? Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, I am... Uh, I really felt the, the Holy Spirit moving and saying that I need to, I need to do this. And so I am. So we're going to start right now. I'm going to fill you in with as many details as I can and why I believe that the word of God shows us plainly. If you will look at the word, you will look at it critically like a Berean would do and not close yourself off from certain parts of the Bible. This is not a word for those particular folks who only know and parrot one phrase. No man knows the day or the hour. If that is how you are going to look at it, I encourage you to listen to this message, but I think there's going to be a lot more to it than, uh, than that single phrase. Is that the word of God? You bet it is, but there's a lot more to it than that, okay? Bride of Christ is getting ready to go in the pre-trib harvest. That is about to, I mean, it is so close. I can, I can feel the breeze from the opening door. It is that close, okay? Now, so what I'm going to do before we actually get started into this, I'm going to say a quick prayer, invite Holy Spirit to be able to come in, to comfort us, to teach us, and to fill us with his knowledge and wisdom as we seek the face of our Amma and, and we look for and welcome our glorious bridegroom, King Jesus. Amen. Abba, Abba, we love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our soul, and everything within us, we want to praise you and lift up your name. We're asking that you will anoint this word, that you are going to reach out to those people and draw them in, that they are going to see this, and they are going to really consider the words as you give me the words to speak. Let it touch their hearts. Let it draw them closer to you and let them look forward to you, Jesus, in your soon coming. And we ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, let's do this. Now, I'm going to start. I've got a bunch of things that I want to show you. And so we're going to go from here. Now, here's one of the things that I want to start with. And it is this. Why am I saying that there are three when so many have taught for so long that there's one? Well, good question, right? And I believe I have come to a, a like a conclusion because of this. Let's get down. I want to show you how God 
way, the way that he calculates time, and it's based on Shemitahs, which are groups of seven years, and they work in cycles, right? So I want to show you something, and I, I really want to give you a bit of perspective on what we're looking at here, okay? So I'm going to show you these, and I encourage you to take snapshots of what you see so you can go back and take a look, okay? All right. Now, this is a really simple one, but the idea is that we know, according to God's word, that it says <clears throat> that the harvest is the end of the age, right? Well, a lot of people, want they want to go down. It's not just the end of the age. It's the last few seconds of the last day of the last, you know, you get the idea, right? That's not what it's saying. It's saying it's at the end of the age. Well, how does he calculate the, the cycles? Through Shemitahs, through sevens. They're calculated seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years. And we get through and we go through the Jubilees, which are seven sevens plus one, which starts the next seven. You get the idea, right? So for the past 2,000 years since the cross, we have been calculating the sevens, okay? And, uh, and, and so right to where we are now, the end of the age would be the last seven, okay? Uh, all right, so this, this is one of the things that I want you to get, okay? So the end of the age would be that last seven, right? Okay, follow me. In that we say, okay, how does that break down? And why are we saying, so harvests or any harvest, we're saying fits within that one seven. So the one that we have is the seven. What we don't have is one harvest. And we've gone throughout the Bible, and, and I encourage you, if you've, if you've looked at, at any of the things that I've taught, that that uh, that here is the point. When you are looking from the through the lens and the scope of the cross, and you're looking 2,000 years away, like Paul was, and he's seeing what's happening there at the end, well, that would, I mean, you're going to look at one small little tiny snippet that's way far off. How many sevens have we got in the last uh, 2,000 years? That's, that's more than 285, isn't it? That's a lot of sevens, right? So when you're looking at there, it's the last seven, that very last one. All right. So we, what I'm saying then is that there are three harvests. We have the barley harvest, we have the wheat harvest, and we have the, the grape harvest, fruit harvest, okay? Those three harvests happen in one season, okay? So what we're saying is this season or this cycle, this smita, all of those harvests will be happening in this one smita, and each of them happen at a different part of the smita. So what happens then is the pre-trib harvest, which would equate to the barley, is going to happen at the beginning of the smita. The mid-tribulation harvest, which, and I will go into this in deep detail, happens in, obviously, in the middle of the smita after three and a half years. And we're going to get into that in detail too, right? People wondered, why why three and a half years? Well, it's three and a half years because it's a seven-year smita. That's why it's in the middle, okay? And then you've got the post-tribulation harvest for all those who go for the all seven years of the time of Jacob's trouble, all th the day of the Lord, all the God's wrath, everything that's going to, those guys, they have their uh, resurrection. And, and, and here's a point uh, that I also want to interject. 
If you look at, and, and I encourage you, I don't have this right in front of me right now, but if you look at Revelation chapter 14, which is talking about the great tribulation, and I, I want to correct a few understandings about that, but generally it's understood to be the worst part of this seven years, right? And this seven years is going to be the last three and a half. That's that particular one. And uh, at and so in Revelation 14, we are told that blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth. Well, what does that mean? That means that there are going to be people that still believe during the great tribulation. They're going to come to faith. We also know that there's going to be a remnant of the Jews that come to faith during the great tribulation. Okay. Okay. So there are dead in Christ during the Great Tribulation. And guess what? There are people that live through it. They are the living at that time. So we're going to cover the process, and we're going to do that in, in detail as well. Okay, so I, I'm hoping I'm making the point that the seven years is, in fact, that last seven-year cycle, that last meta, that is the end of the age. All right. Okay. Now, while we're talking about that, because that's going to bring up the next one that we have, and that is this. Tribulation or wrath? I've got a lot to say about this, brothers and sisters. Okay. Now, you notice how they call it pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. It's tribulation everywhere. I would really recommend that you don't even use those terms, right? I try not to myself. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It is, it, you know, it's the, the last smita. It is the, it's these things to highlight the fact that it's seven years. But you've got those that say, well, that last seven years, it's all tribulation. It's the tribulation period. And I don't like that at all because we all suffer tribulation, right? And I'm going to go into that. Then you've got the other group that says, well, it's all wrath. Okay. Well, and they're saying then we're not appointed to wrath. Therefore, we don't have to go through any of it any of it. Therefore, everybody goes in a pre-tribulation harvest if you believe in the Lord. No, that's not the way it works. And I'm going to show you why, if you will follow me. I want to show you something that's really going to kind of illustrate the difference between tribulation and wrath. Okay, so here we go. Another slide. And I encourage you, please take a snapshot. Okay. All right. Now, I want to go ahead and cover this and explain just exactly what we're looking at here, okay? Now, let's start with wrath. Now, what is wrath? Nobody wants to suffer wrath. But the problem is all people are under condemnation until they believe. They are all abiding in wrath. If, if we look down here, it says that all people before salvation are a child of wrath, okay? Now, it didn't say it's just you're a child of wrath if you make it to the, to the end of the age. No, you're a child of wrath now if you are not a believer now. If you were not a believer then, you were a child of wrath then. You get the idea, right? John 3.36 tells us, that the wrath of God abides on him who does not believe, right? And that word abide means stays on, stuck to, glued to. That wrath is on you, my friend, and you don't get it off unless and until you receive saving faith in Jesus Christ, right? Ephesians 2 verse 3 says, All mankind by nature are children of wrath, right? By nature of wrath, all mankind. Now, it's not just a few people that's, you know, that, that we say at the end of the age, okay? But what happens? I've, I've got a little stick figure here, and this is the person who 
once at that particular moment in his life walk, and this is the walk of wrath, right? That's on a road, as you can see, to a road of damnation. That's the road everyone is on until and unless they receive that saving faith in Jesus with his finished work on the cross, right? All right. So this person, for our illustration, has received that saving faith. He's believed in Jesus. He has received that free gift of salvation, and he is now taken off of that path of wrath. He is no longer appointed to wrath. He is moved, but where is he moved to? Is he moved to the path of everything's free and wonderful? Is he moved to the path of, oh, it's all, you know, butterflies and, and unicorns? No. Where does he get moved to? He gets moved to the path of tribulation. Now, I know I, I, people's minds, there's this, uh, you know, uh, uh, this dissonance that's occurring, right? It's like, wait, whoa, 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 wait. Every, you're free in Christ. You've got all this. Okay, yes, all of that is true. But it's also true that you are going to suffer tribulation as a believer. Now, if you look under here, John 16, verse 33 says, you shall have tribulation. And who's the shall? That's going to be all of the people who are believers and are saved by the blood of the Lamb. They are, I am, you are, brothers and sisters, going to have tribulation in life. Now, I see that like, well, yeah, but Wayne, this tribulation is different. That tribulation is like a super, super duper sprinkled covering tribulation. Not this tribulation. Yeah, this is some trouble. No, it does not say that at all. You are going to suffer tribulation from the moment you believe. Look at those, right, star child, the letters of the churches, what it says. You're going to suffer tribulation 10 days, right? Some of you are going to be thrown into jail. Some of you, get, it talks about that. The churches are believers, folks. I know that there are some people that argue against that as well. But you're going to suffer tribulation. But here's the good news. That road of tribulation leads, as you can see here, to eternal life. You're no longer on that wrath road of damnation. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 says, we are not appointed to wrath. That's right. Once you're on that tribulation road, you are going to suffer for Jesus, but you're not going to suffer the wrath, the punishment of God into eternal damnation anymore. Now, there's one, I want to also make this connection here. There's eternal life, and there's damnation. And, and you think like, so why, what, what do we have this way? Uh, it's worked this way for the last 2,000 years as I have up, and it will work the same way for the last seven, right? Um, and uh, it, it's, it's just, that's just the way it's going to work, all right? So I'm hoping that you get the idea Yes, we are going to suffer tribulation. It, it, if you are not a friend of the world, oh yes, the world is going to be coming against you. That's not wrath. That's tribulation. Trials and tribulations are going to come your way because the enemy is going to seek to tempt you to get you out of that faith, to lose that faith, to get away from it, to, to not go near it, to never receive it in the first place. That's what he's going to try to do. And then what he's going to do is, while you're claiming it, he's going to try to get you into guilt and into sin and all of these different things, right? Trying to tempt you. And it is pressure on you. It is suffering to carry your cross daily, right? But that's what Jesus says to do. And that's what we as believers do. And we understand that these trials will come. We are told, we are promised, right? That's the promise from Jesus. 
these trials, these tribulations, these temptations will come. You shall have them. All right. That's what we want to get. So tribulation is not wrath. Those are two separate paths. So when we get to people that are talking about, well, tribulation equals wrath, you know, in this set, the last seven years, it's the same thing. No, it's not. And I would encourage you not to even use those terms because it, it, it gets people, you use the language, I, I guess it's a bit sloppy if you think about it, okay? So, so try to, if you can, try not to even look at it that way. Because if you do, it's like, well, wait a minute. If you go in to the tribulation, okay, and you receive your, guess what? You went into the tribulation as a child of wrath. You're going to be, you know, wrath is going to abide on you unless and until you receive that saving faith in Jesus. And you are going to be moved off of that path onto the other one. That's the path to eternal life. That's the way it works. And it's only one way, folks. Okay? You go from wrath to eternal life, or you just continue down the wrath path. Okay? That's the way it works. Uh, I am not one of those that says that you can lose your salvation. There's a lot you can lose, right? But if you truly receive saving faith in Jesus, then you are saved. That's that's the way it's going to go. Um, if, if you're kind of vacillating back and forth and you're saying, yeah, but I, I don't know, I, I could be saved, maybe not saved, I, I don't know. Maybe you're not. Uh, you know, I, it, it, what, what is the word tells us? You know, don't be double-minded, right? How can anyone think to receive anything from God if you're going to be double-minded? You receive it by faith, okay? So let's do that. All right, so let's let's continue because I want to uh, discuss a few more things here. All right, and this is uh, about the three harvests, okay? And I want to talk about this, and this is going to be well, one of the things that I'm going to teach about as far as why there are three harvests and why it's not one, and why the Bible is. It seems it's quite plain uh, when you actually look at the words and you see what it says. It, it, I don't know how you can see it any other way unless you are just stuck in your thing. You, you know, it's that little child in the corner going, no, 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 I can't hear you. No, no, no. Well, don't be like that, okay? Because the Word of God is beautiful. It's beautiful. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. So let me show you this. All right. Let's take a snapshot of this, if you will. Okay. All right. Now, not the prettiest thing, but you're going to see what I, I'm getting at here in a minute. Okay. All right. Now, so what we got is our little snowman on the left. Okay. And in which we have our uh, head, which is Christ. It represents Christ. And then the big ball, which is the body of Christ, okay? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse uh, 27. Hey, Brother Peter Paul, it's good to see you. God bless you. 1227, now you are together the body of Christ, and individually you are members of him. Now, I don't think that there's uh, uh, much question that there is one body, right? There's one body, uh, just like any body that we look at. It's uh, 10 fingers, 10 toes, you know, that's that, that type of thing. Those are individual members, but they all make up one body, okay? So when, when we get this, we go like, okay, see, there you go. There's only one body that can go. I've got a couple questions for you. Okay. Does anybody get saved after the pre-tribulation rapture? Anybody? 
Well, I would say yes. In fact, there are many, many, many more that are going to be saved after that fact than are going to be in the pre-tribulation rapture to begin with. Well, if they are, in fact, even if there is one, it doesn't matter. But my point is, aren't they part of the body? Would you say no? If, if you know what I'm saying, of course they are. They're part of the body, right? Well, then you, you got the people with the cognitive dissonance going like, I don't understand. The whole body has to go. You can't have parts of the body go. And I'm going just like, I've talked about this before. Okay, well, you can have the head from the body go and be gone for 2,000 years, but the body has to all go at once. It can't go in separate pieces. Why not? Okay, the Bible says it does, and I'm going to show that to you now, okay? All right, and the reason why is if you look up there, I'm showing you about that the body of Christ is one unit, and that is not a series. Oh, okay. And you think like, well, Wayne, what, what does that mean? Okay. Well, and okay, I'm going to tell you, we're going to look at the verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. Now, I mean, that whole passage is quite uh, good, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at one particular passage there in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. And I'm actually going to show you this because I got it out of the interlinear because I want to point something out to you there. Woo, there we go. We're on a, we're on a ship. All right. You got that? All right. So this is what it says, right? What, what Paul is telling us that when the rapture occurs, it says that each is going to be in their own order. Christ the first fruits, and then those that are Christ at his coming, right? All right. And, and, and many of you know that. Yeah, okay, Wayne, right? What are you saying? I want you to look at that word order, right? And that is the, from Strong's Greek 5001, tagma, okay? And that means a rank, a division, an ordered series. From Tasso, something orderly in arrangement, a series or succession. Now, I've mentioned before that this term is a military term, and we're talking about like an army is composed, so the army would be the body, okay, for illustration purposes. Well, that army is composed of companies, right? You've got Company Alpha, Company Bravo, Company Charlie, okay? Those types of things, right? And all of those companies or battalions or whatever components you want to use, my, my point being is that each of those are individual, right? But they all, as members, make up that particular army. And I used the example uh, several times before is that when you've got a review, you know, a military parade in which you've got your armies are going past your commander in chief or whomever, and maybe a general or whatever, and they're saluting their commander. Okay. And, uh, and so do you have this whole army as one big deal go by them and then go, okay, everybody salutes and, you know, you can see them all going off like a millipede, right? No, that's not what it does. You've got company A, step, 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 okay, and then and they go, they go by, and then, uh, then company B, you, you see, comes up the same thing, then they go through that whole process, then company C, or battalion B, or, you get the point, each one in their own order, it's a series and a succession, Company C does not come before Company A. Company A went first, then Company B went second. And, and liken it like this, uh, uh, in, in reviews that I have been a part of, we had an honor company. And 
that honor company went first because they they had won this as an award it was a reward for for their service they 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 had all of these special things that they came out on top of as far as grades as far as um you know um uh, tests as far as uh, uh, you know, various different things, inspections and so forth, right? And they're all graded on that and then they come out. And so all the armies, have been, uh, all, uh, the, all the groups that make up the army, then you got this one group that comes out on top and then they are awarded this honor. They are the honor company and they lead the rest. And this is going to be just like what happens in the three harvest. They are rewards. They are a series. The pre-tribulation award or reward goes to the first, right? That's going to be the first. Then the mid-trib, that is going to be the middle one, right? And then you've got the last one, and they are going to go. It's a series, it's succession. Uh, and so uh, what we've got here, I want to go back to this other picture and show you once again. Okay, so what you see over here on the right side, yes, you've got the whole body is broken into parts in which part goes pre-trib, part goes mid-trib, part goes post-trib, but they're all part of the body, okay? Uh, this is one of the things I wanted to be able to show. This was out of uh, John 3.36. Uh, and, th and this is dealing with a graph. It kind of goes back on that again. And I want you to see what we've got here, how the wrath abides, but the believing in the Son has life eternal. So in this one verse of John 3, 36, we see those two pathways, okay? All right, so now what we want to look at, uh, let's see, I want to go back to that one we were just looking at, uh, and that is 1 Corinthians 15, 23 that each according to his own order. This is how the harvest, this is how the rapture is going to take place. It is a series or succession. And having one piece is not a series. One piece is not a succession. One piece is not an order. So you say like, well, okay, well, Jesus went first and the body can go second. But that is not what the word says. Each man according to his own order. It says Christ, the first fruits. He goes, then each man according to his order. Not according to Christ first and then everybody else, right? You understand what I'm saying? All right. I just want you to understand there's a succession and it is so plainly seen when we just look at what the word says, okay? This it, it doesn't take a lot. You're not twisting the words. You're not trying to find meanings that aren't there or some type of, oh, well, you've got a word that has 40 different meanings and you pick this one and like, oh, okay, see, it can mean this. No, it, it, that's what it means. That word tagma means a succession or an ordered series. Okay, so that means that the raptures occur in an ordered series series. All right. All right. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, I've got these other things. Uh, let's talk about the tribulation. John 16, 33, uh, King James, these things I have spoken to you that in me, you might have peace in the world. You shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, wait, I have to look at that again. It says, we are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain the rapture pre-trib. No, it does not say that. It says to obtain salvation. And that's another thing I'm going to uh, talk about, is that 
And just because you are no longer on the path to wrath does not mean you automatically go in the pre-trib rapture because that is a reward. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you just like I'm showing you this, right? All right. Uh, how many brides did Jesus have? Uh, we have one Jesus. Well, um, that one Jesus, that's interesting. And, 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 and that's usually kind of a, like a catch of uh, one human Jesus who is now one with the Father who is omnipresent, omnipotent, and all-knowing, right? Uh, so uh, one of the things was when I was standing before Jesus, and if you haven't seen my testimony, my afterlife testimony, you might need to take a look at that. Uh, and I encourage you to do so, uh, because as I was standing at the foot of the cross, knowing what Jesus was thinking about me personally, that he would have gone to that cross and suffered like he is suffering. It was horrible suffering and died just for me. If I was the only person in all of human history that ever would have said yes to him, then he would have still done it just for me. Now, I want you to understand this. He feels that very same way about each and every one of you. You can have such a personal relationship, just like a husband and wife, intimate level personal relationship, and he can have that with every single person that he has created. That's the way it works. He's God. He's not limited by mortal flesh anymore. He did do that for us, but he's not limited anymore. And I'm telling you, so when you say, when you, there, there's that in, in implied gotcha, oh, well, he's only got one. Yes, there's one bride just like he has one body that's comprised of many members. Well, he has one bride that comes out and is one of those members, and it is composed of many parts, right? There are many people that are there. That's the way it is. Um, and I, I, I encourage you to look back at other messages where I go into very deep detail about that, okay? All right, so let me, I'm going to just skip through these things. Uh, this is uh, John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you might have tribulation, you shall have tribulation, but be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, does he say you are not going to have tribulation? No, he guarantees you will have it. And he's actually saying that, uh, you know, be of good cheer. When that happens, right, he's overcome the world. All right. So you got, let's go into this, this final part here, because I'm trying to keep this short. And that's, okay, Wayne. All right. Three, three harvests. All right. Why are you saying that they are rewards? Again, because I would say that the word of God says they are <laughs> rewards. Okay. All right, so here's what we got, and uh, my uh, several of my proof texts. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you out of uh, Philippians chapter three. I'm gonna use that. And now in this, I'm I'm not going to uh, read the entire chapter, but I am gonna read uh, several things. Right, um, he uh, starting. He talks about at, at the beginning about having confidence in the flesh, right? All right. It doesn't matter, right? Ultimately, what he says, starting at verse 7, chapter 3 of Philippians, he says, But what things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. 
Now you think like, wait, wait a minute, that when is that, are we talking about salvation here? No, actually we're not. We, he, he's, is anyone questioning whether he was saved at this point? Uh, no, he was saved and he's talking to the church at Philippi. And uh, so he's talking to other believers. So let's go on. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10. Now, of course, it, that's what Jesus says. When he comes, will he find faith on the earth? Yeah, he's got to hold on to that faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Folks, let me read that again. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now that we can actually do an entire message just on that particular phrase, which reads kind of weird and people are scratching their head trying to figure out like, what is he talking about? Okay. If he's saved, he's already, even if you're not saved, you're going to be in the resurrection, right? You're not going to be in a good resurrection, but you're going to be in one of them. Uh, verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize, that's a reward, folks, prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm going to show you something about that in just a second, which I hope is going to be a mind blower to you. This is not, you know, everybody talks about, what's the upward call? Let's talk about that. I'm going to show you what that is in the Greek, okay? Uh, let us therefore, as many be perfect and be less minded, and, and if anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it unto you, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. But he's pressing towards the mark. Remember, he's running this. He's using the metaphor of running a race in which one gets the prize, one wins the trophy. And that's where he tells everyone that's on this same race, run as if to attain, run as if to win, right? You want to win the prize. You've got earthly folks and they are running the race and, and one gets a, you know a, uh, an award that's going to be worthless right? Very soon they get this olive wreath that's going to wither and, you know, crumble and be useless. But we are working for a reward that does not fade, right? And it's a reward. Okay, well, how is that different? Salvation, brothers and sisters, is a free gift. A free gift is not a reward. You work for rewards, right? And so how do we know he's working for a reward? Well, he says so. He says that I forget those things are, which are behind and reaching forth. He's pressing forward. You know what? When you have a runner that sits there and they give that last push at the tape there at the end to, to try to get that little extra stretch, right? To get over the finish line first. That's that striving. That's that working. Is he working for salvation? No, he has the salvation, but he wants to attain a particular reward, right? And that's what he's pushing for. Now you think, okay, well, I hope you get that. We're going to look at this, and I'm going to show you that, Philippians 3.14, and I'm going to show you in the Greek, okay? And I want you to take a, a little shot of this, okay? Hold on, let's, there we go. All right. Okay. Now I want to sh just highlight a couple of words, uh, brabion, which is prize, award. 
th there's not a whole host of different meanings. It's a prize. It's not a gift. It's not something that's handed to you for free. It is a prize you work for, a reward for something you have done spectacular, okay? Then we look over at the upward calling, and you'll notice that word, kaisios. Uh, it's a calling or an invitation, an upward invitation. Does that sound familiar to anybody, brothers and sisters? What about in uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1? And I saw a door opened up in heaven and a voice that spoke with me like a trumpet. And he said to me, come up here. That sounds like an invitation to me, an upward invitation. What about in uh, Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses, and, and we hear this loud voice. And we're going to cover this because... Everybody in the world hears this, okay? We're going to cover that. And it, and he says, and everybody hears in this voice, come up here. That is an upward invitation. I, yeah, and I'm just telling to you, that's what it is. That is our invitation. Upward calling, eh, an invitation, an upward invitation. Come up here. Hold on to that, brothers and sisters, okay? All right, so let's go. I want you to see this next. And I'm going to just highlight a couple of things from the mid-trib harvest because most everyone knows about the pre-trib and what we're looking at there. Everybody wants to shove it all in, but I want to show you some things that I find from the mid-trib. Everybody and their brother-in-law knows about the post-trib, right? No man knows the day or the hour. Okay, I just, I'm sorry. Okay, take uh, just a little shot of this, okay? Do, 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 okay? And so what we have here, uh, I, I, there are several groups that are going to be part of this mid-drip harvest. And that is what's going to be the wheat harvest. I know that there are some that talk about, no, the... Uh, you know, we're the wheat. And, yeah, okay, we, we won't go into all that. That's for all the folks that think that the mid-trib harvest is the thing, right? They don't want to consider a pre-trib. They don't want to consider a post-trib. It's just the one. However, so we've got 144,000 from the tribes of Israel that are sealed. But that's back in Revelation chapter 6, right? All right, so here's the thing. What, where did, why? 12 tribes, and everybody says, well, they're all Jewish evangelists. Maybe, maybe, but here's the important thing, I think. Back in the day when the temple was destroyed and all the tribes were scattered, where were they scattered to? All over the Gentile world. And I think that's where we've got, you've probably seen pe uh, people that's on YouTube and, and they can trace their ancestry back to a tribe. Uh, what is a crowing rooster prophecy? Uh, and he, he, he traced his lineage back to the tribe of Levi, for example. Uh, there, and you, so you see what I mean. There are going to be 12,000, I believe, from all of these tribes, and they're going to be all over the world. And these are people that are going to be preaching Jesus, and they're going to be preaching Jesus to the left behind, okay? That's what I think. So you're not going to have 144,000 of these guys just roaming around Jerusalem or Israel and just trying. No, they were scattered all over the world, and God is going to seal these particularly picked people, where they are. Could they be in New York? Could they be in South America? Can you understand what I'm saying? They are going to be sealed. There's going to be 12,000 from each of those 12 tribes, and they are going to be testifying, preaching Jesus. That's what they're going to be preaching. They're going to be preaching Jesus, okay? All right. Then we've got two witnesses, they're also preaching Jesus. But where are they preaching Jesus? They're preaching Jesus in Israel 
from Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is they talk about that. And so we go like, well, wait a minute. Uh, so they are going to be testifying. They're going to be giving their testimony. And it's the testimony of Jesus, right? So that's what's going to happen there. All right. Uh, then we've got uh, two other groups, all the dead in Christ up to the midpoint worldwide, post pre-trib from that point up to the mid-trib. So there's going to be those that come to faith in Christ and die in Christ at that point. And there's going to be a lot of living in Christ uh, up to that midpoint when that happens as well. Maybe not many at that point, but there's going to be some. We know that that's going to be it. And we know that this is going to be, if you look at this from a worldwide evangelical standpoint, this is going to be the largest coverage of Jesus that the world has ever known. And so that's why I'm, uh, we're going to look at this for a minute. Let's talk about something I think is really interesting. And I'm going to talk about Revelation 11. And I'm going to highlight a couple of things here. Uh, in verse 3, it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses. These are two witnesses of Jesus. Okay? They're his two witnesses. Let's uh, go jump down to verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, what is their testimony? It's the testimony of Jesus, right? Then it says, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, I'm going to read these next few verses, and I want you to, uh, I'm going to highlight something that I think is very interesting here. And uh, the beast shall uh, make war against them, shall overcome them and kill them, verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse 9, poke up the ears, folks. And they, highlight the word they, because you're going to hear this several times, and I want to point something that I think is also another great nugget here. And they, of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, shall see their dead bodies three and a half days and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now, who are they of the people? These are all the people of the world, right? Kindreds, tongues, nations, everybody is going to see them. That's the they, right? But is that the only they? No, okay, let's keep going. Verse 10, and they, here we are again, that dwell upon the earth, the same people, right? shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets uh, tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Okay. Now, verse 11, uh, and we're going to, it's going to then kick into verse 12, which we're going to see. And after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them. <coughs> Excuse me. And they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Now, that them is the they, right? Okay, the two theys, that's all the people of the world, the ones that dwell on the earth, these unsaved folks that are just rejoicing over this, thinking that, oh, we got him. But great fear fell upon them when they see them stand up, right? Then verse 12, and they... Here we go again. That's the third day. This is the same group of people, the world people. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, the two witnesses, come up hither. There's our invitation again, folks. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Verse 13, and I want to end with this. And the same hour was there a great earthquake. Now that great, the word there great is the same word in the Greek is mega. So this is truly a mega quake. Okay. So and we're not talking about, so this mega quake is going to be 
worldwide. That's what I'm saying. It's and so what happens locally, we see something that happens locally. And so, but the reason why I'm saying it's the world, you're going to see here in a second. And a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, um, why am I saying that this is the same group of people, the they, the they, the they, the they. And that is because you know, if it's just a group of people, they've already seen what God did, raising these uh, dead witnesses up, bringing them up to heaven. There's a voice that they heard, right? And that great voice, that's a mega voice, right? And, uh, and come up hither. Do you think if there was just an earthquake, they didn't hear anything, it's not a big deal to them, right? There's this big earthquake, they're going to give glory to God over it? No, 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 no. The reason why they're giving glory to God is that they recognize it's all God. God's the one that raised them up. God is the one who talked to them. They heard the voice of God. God is the one who had this great earthquake and these ones that managed to live, they were scared, you know, skinless, if you want, and they gave glory to God because they knew this was God doing it. You see what I'm saying? Okay. And so that's, uh, and then now I want to jump down to verse 18 because now that then leads to post-trib. We've now had uh, the, uh, the uh, well, I guess I should point something out, right? I kind of jumped ahead too quick. Great earthquake. Anytime we have a resurrection, it seems to be accompanied by an earthquake, right? Uh, in uh, Matthew, we've got a great earthquake and all the rocks were open and many of the dead that were in there, uh, the saints arose and came out after Jesus's resurrection, right? There's an earthquake. Um, we see... There's an earthquake here, and I believe that that pretends this is the worldwide earthquake in which that's going to be the dead in Christ that's worldwide that's going to be resurrected at that time. And we also have at the very end, what do we have? And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and at the uh, time of the dead that they should be judged. Well, pay attention here, please and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. This is happening at the end of the tribulation, right? Now, I'm, I'm wanting to point something out because there's number of folks that want to make the barley harvest to be the Old Testament saints. Well, they, a lot of times there's no question that uh, when a harvest occurs, pre-trib harvest, what happens? First thing, rewards are given, right? And so if the Old Testament saints were the ones that were resurrected when, the, uh, when Jesus was resurrected, wouldn't they already have their rewards? Are we wait? Are they supposed to wait till the end with the rest of these folks, and then they get their reward? Right? No, that doesn't make any sense. Each person gets their reward at that time because that judgment. What comes after after this life? Then the judgment. Right? So what what and what I've said many many times is that the Old Testament saints are where they receive their resurrection at the end of the tribulation. That's what Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 lays out plainly. If you look at it, you can see that. And so I'm just wanting to point out that there are <laughs> rewards and, uh, and they, the Old Testament prophets, get their rewards at the end because that's when they get their resurrection. Well, if that's the case, then who's the barley? That's the bride, brothers and sisters. Pre-trib harvest of the bride. That 
is who is going first. And the sleepy left behind church and the rest of the world is going to be here. But there is going to be the greatest harvest, the wheat harvest that will take place under the hot summer sun and being run over by the tribulum. And that's going to prepare them and remove that hard kernel from them so that the meat underneath can be presented, right? That's what you want, the grain that is cleaned and prepared. And that's what's going to happen. All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and call that uh, day here right at one hour, folks. I actually made it one hour. I'm just going to go ahead. If you have any questions, you can contact me, WayneFowerNDE at gmail.com. And uh, so let's prepare for the pre-trib harvest. If you're seeing anything that's happening, folks, you know it's going to take place. I love you all, brothers and sisters. If you don't know Jesus, the gospel is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and resurrected after three days. If you receive that free gift of salvation that he offers to you because he loves you more than you could possibly know, then you are going to have eternal life eternal life, eternal life. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a new car. It, 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 you may, but that doesn't mean that's what you get. God's free gift is eternal life in heaven with him. That is worth more than anything this world could ever offer you. Give it up, turn it away, just accept that free gift grow closer to him. The time is short. I love you all, brothers and sisters. God bless you, and I'll see you in the clouds. Maranatha.